And one of the things that I find very exhilarating about Australia, and I've been here about four and a half years, is that the social networks in the country are extremely shallow. We've all heard about the six degrees of separation, so we're six people away from any other person on the planet. And we know that in Australia, in general, no, it's more like two degrees of separation, and that's particularly true if you're in a profession. Now, it may be less true across the population as a whole. I might not know some random person in Kogoli, and I might not know someone who knows that person. But it is definitely true within the professional domain. So after four and a half years, if you're in the social media or new media spaces, or if you're in film and television production, either I know you or I know someone who knows you. Now, the most consequential of those connections end up, say, in email and in my address book and, of course, in my Facebook friends list. Now, how many of you have Facebook accounts? So we've got pretty much blanket coverage now. And these connections that I might make when I meet you here or meet you in uh, some other venue, they evolve because first we might exchange email addresses, then we might friend each other in Facebook or send each other an invitation or something. And then what will happen is if we want to deepen that relationship, we'll start flipping each other links. We will find things and go, oh, that's absolutely perfect for this particular person. Filter it and then forward it along to that person. And every time we do this, we establish a deeper bond with that person. Now, the interesting thing here is that if I get it wrong, if I send you something that is totally abhorrent, it will actually rupture that link. So that's actually a bi-directional relationship. But in general, each transmission just reinforces that network. And the more we share with each other, the stronger those bonds become. And now all that sharing forms its own covert network. It's invisible to view, but it is resilient, and it's increasingly important to each one of us. So that's the network in Australia, which, of course, carries gossip, because Australians love to gossip, you know that. And it carries insights, it carries opportunities, and it carries news. Now, that means that in a country even as geographically dispersed as Australia, news travels very, very fast. And it's interesting to watch that, and it's terrifying to participate in, because outrageous behavior is always carried at nearly the speed of light. For example, how many of you were in the future of journalism event on Friday? So, <clears throat> Roy Greenslade, I believe via satellite from London, made a few choice comments about Andrew Jaspin. Have you all heard them by now? No? That's interesting. Well, <clears throat> he basically said that Andrew Jaspin was not up to the job. And he said it very clearly. And the interesting thing is that uh, he made these comments in almost immediately because there were journalists in the room who were live blogging and sending text messages and posting articles to Crikey later on in the day, that when Andrew Dam, uh, when a, a Greenslade damned Jaspin, I didn't hear about it immediately because I was at the other end of ABC Ultimo filming an episode of The New Inventors, but I heard about it almost as soon as I walked out because I know Margaret Simmons and I know Roseanne Burston and they were both in the room. And the surprising thing is that, you know, not that I heard about it so quickly, but the surprising thing would have been if I hadn't heard about it at all. So all of this means that as Australians, we are under intense pressure to behave very nice in public because bad behavior, for instance, a terrifyingly honest assessment of someone's qualifications for a job, so excites the network of connections that it gets transmitted infinitely quickly. Think about the number of times you've seen the video of Glenn Milne <coughs> hitting Stephen Maine, and you have an idea of what we're talking about. And of course, within our professional social networks, we're so well connected these days that those messages propagate ubiquitously. So, to everyone whom Greenslade's comments were salient, every one of those people basically heard about them within a few minutes of him uttering them. There was a perfect meeting between the message and the audience, and that's a new thing. So part two, mind bomb. Now, over the last few months, I've grown increasingly enamored of a web 2.0 technology known as Twitter. Now, how many of you have used Twitter? Not so bad. All right, so Twitter started off originally sort of introducing itself as a microblogging site. You can send, you can post a tweet, which is what the message is called, of about 140 characters. And that message is then replicated and transmitted to everyone who has chosen to follow you. And so you have a list of people who are following your tweets, and you also have a list of people who, whose tweets you are following. 
And one of the nice things about Twitter is that it's multimodal. I can send a tweet from a mobile phone, I can send it from a web browser, and they've completely opened up the software architecture so people are inventing new and interesting ways to send tweets all the time. Now, at the moment, Twitter is in the domain of the early adopters. There's about a million worldwide users in Twitter, and about 200,000 of them are using it on any given week, and they're sending about 3 million tweets a day. Now, that doesn't sound like very many people, but that 200,000 people represent the thought leaders in new media and social media, so their influence is incredibly disproportionate. This may not be the CIO of a particular organization, but this is who the CIO turns to if they need to answer a question about new media or social media. And, okay, so if you're that person, you're that thought leader, and now your CIO has asked you a question, and you need some input, who do you turn to? Well, you turn to Twitter. So for a simple example, I sat down to write this talk, and I had no idea how many Twitter users there were in the world, so I posted this question to my tweet. That was it. And within a few minutes, Stilgarian, who writes for Crikey, posted back with the answer. And he also posted a link to his blog where he talks about Twitter and Twitter's growth and how he's become quite addicted to it. Now, before I threw this question out to the Twitter audience, I searched Google. Of course, I'm not stupid and I don't want to be called a fool, so of course you type in search terms into Google and I got no love. The best estimate I could get out of Google was over a year old. So, instead, I did the next best thing. I turned to the 250 or so people who are my Twitter followers. And because of my own connectedness, both in the social media communities in America and in Australia and throughout the world, I have access to an enormous reservoir of expertise. If I don't know the answer to the question and I can't find out the answer to that question online, I know someone who has the answer to that question. So. Twitter, which is gossipy and noisy and inane and frequently extremely meaningless, is also my 21st century brain trust. So with Twitter, I have immediate access to a broad range of very intelligent people. And their interests maybe overlap mine, but not so completely that we have nothing to talk about. They overlap mine in a complementary way. So Twitter ends up extending my native capabilities because it gives me a high degree of continuous connectivity with individuals who complement my own native capabilities. And that is a new thing. Now, William Gibson, a science fiction author and very keen social observer, once wrote that the street finds its own use for things, uses its manufacturers never intended. And the truest value test of value for any technology is does the street care? And the answer, uh, in the case of Twitter, the answer is a resounding yes. Because this capacity of personal enhancement, I call it hyper-empowerment, this is not what Twitter was designed to do, which was just sort of the posting of simple factual messages. The harvesting of experience of my oh-so-expert social network is a behavior that grew out of my continued interactions with Twitter. All right, it wasn't planned for, it wasn't designed for by Twitter's creators, it wasn't something I walked up to Twitter thinking to do. It just happened. And not every Twitter user puts Twitter to this use. But online, people will see what I'm doing, and because that behavior is successful, and I didn't necessarily come up with this behavior, but they'll see me doing this behavior, they'll see me succeeding because of it, and they will copy that behavior. That's what we do, that's what human beings do. And so this behavior is going to replicate more and more quickly until it's a bog standard behavior for all 